This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're back with Community Matters. I'm Jay Fidel. It's a three o'clock rock. Okay, <laughs> we have Claire Hannes again. She's an immigration attorney and the founder of Aloha Immigration. Aloha Immigration. There should be Aloha in immigration. There needs to be more of it. I'm trying client by client, case by case. Well, you practiced immigration law for many years, actually. And um, in various places and contexts and all that, you've seen a lot come and go. But you're now in a special time, aren't you? This is different than anything you've seen before. Am I right? Yeah, special in a bad kind of way. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's yep. what I mean. Yep. I mean, yeah. attacks, attacks against immigrants uh, on the ground and f uh, from Washington are really at an all-time high. And uh, uh, where we were talking just a few years ago about the possibility of comprehensive immigration reform and, and um, being able to provide new avenues of relief for people who desperately need it, uh, we're um, really, really swimming upstream. And it's all kind of defensive now to try to keep the few gains that were made in the past, uh, including DACA, which is a, a program that allowed uh, individuals who were brought as children to the United States to have a temporary protection from deportation. Um, all those things are now uh, kind of in the crosshairs of the Trump administration. It's scorched earth. It's at every level and every way he can possibly think of. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. and. Um, it's hard because there's a lot of issues that uh, that I, as a uh, as an individual, are concerned about. But um, immigration is uh, is taking up all of my time, and, and then yeah. some. But there are lots of we have to be really looking at multiple fronts for um, uh, civil rights and civil liberties and how they're being uh, trounced. You know, <clears throat> funny thing is that um, this started out back around January 20th under the rubric. Uh, we're going to protect the country from terrorism. Right. Um, and then he, you know, made his ban, uh, you know, his, his sort of amorphous ban about, you know, Arab countries. Right. Um, but, you know, there hasn't been so much talk about that lately. It's more like any foreigner yeah. uh, is, is at risk. And then, you know, to me, uh, and we, we get into the more detail of it, but then to me, if I look at what happened in Charlottesville a few days ago, and I look at his remarks yesterday, right. revealing his true thoughts about this, right. uh, what I get is it doesn't have that much to do about terrorism at all. In mm -hmm. fact, it has to do about racial supremacy. Right. Right. supremacy. Right. right. No, I, I agree, and it's not just it's not just um, immigrants. It's 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 a larger um, classification, I guess, of of people of color. And, um, and, and many immigrants fall into that category. And so um, you know, immigrants are, are, are taking the same kind of hits that African Americans um, and uh, even Latinos who've lived in the United States um, from, you know, tra who can trace their history back to before the United States was the United States. Uh, have been taking hits for a long, long, <laughs> yeah, right? Have, have been taking hits for a long, long time. Yeah. Uh, and um, it's really, it's, I, I think it's just the most knee jerk. Like, people are scared. The economy's bad. Uh, uh, white folks who used to be able to plan on generation after generation, their lives being better, having more opportunities than their parents, having more opportunities than their parents, don't have that anymore. Uh, we're looking for somebody to blame. And immigrants are um, always uh, the easiest uh, group to blame. And, and again, this, and this, Xenophobia that we're seeing towards immigrants isn't just, uh, and people of color isn't unique, of course, to the United States. It's actually, it's a trend uh, in many European countries. Uh, Australia has some very arguably racist uh, immigration policies as well. Um, but yeah, this is a very this is a very special time to be doing the work that I'm doing uh, in yeah. the United States. One one uh, reaction to that though, a buddy of mine just got back from China. Mm -hmm. And um, he found a very interesting phenomenon in, in China. You know, China has a huge presence now in Africa. In fact, they have military bases that we right. don't have. Right. The, uh, they have a military base and lots of business enterprises, big ones, uh, big presence in Africa. And African people are coming to China. 
they're emigrating to China. Mm. And China welcomes them. And they marry Chinese, okay? So now you have this Hapa Haole effect, or uh, that's not the right word, but Hapa right. African right. effect, right. Um, you know, going on in China. And I said to him, I said, gee, you know, is there racial prejudice against the Africans in, in China? And he said, no, no. They, they, they don't see that. In fact, they appreciate the thing, and these people have good opportunities in China. And I find, I find that interesting. I'm not sure that we have a good sampling of opinion on it, but, but I find it interesting uh, to, to, for the proposition that the U.S. brand of treating diverse races is different and morally less, less developed than mm. other countries. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, for all the talk about being a nation of immigrants, um, we're sure hard on immigrants, right? And there's this attitude that, um, well, uh, you know, our um, our family did it one way, um, but but it was legal for those people to do it. I mean, the the waves of immigrants that came from um, from Europe in 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 generations past, there there was a legal pathway for that to happen. The problem is now we don't have that legal pathway for many people to come into the United States. And, um, you know, as far as, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to look, at, to look at China because I've looked at racism in, in other Asian countries towards African Americans as I was doing research, research on hardship issues in cases. And I know African Americans, and it's been well-documented racism in Korea and in, and in Japan. So I'm not, I don't know how, I don't know how different the United States is really um, having lived in Australia, having uh, friends uh, who are Europeans. Um, yeah, I don't really know if it's if it's if it's that much worse. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot, you know. There's a lot. Uh, there's a lot more of us, and you know, racist. I mean, as far as people in the United States versus um, uh, the sizes of other countries, and there are. Um, I, I, you know, the, I think that the racist groups are actually, you know, it's a minority. Uh, they're not, they're not the majority, but they've, but they've sure got a voice now. They've got, they've got a voice in the White House, and um, and even though that's a very small group, of course, it was a much larger group that supported that ascension, Trump's ascension into well, the into the White House. Well, let me offer the thought that after this experience over the past few days following Charlottesville, I think there'll be more people in that supremacy group because they will be attracted and they will be encouraged yeah. to come out on the issue because now they know, they know that the president um, uh, doesn't really condemn racism. Right, and the, and the statements unfortunately of the last couple days um, definitely, definitely confirm that, which yeah. puts, um, you know, the issues of, of immigration, again, uh, uh, in a really, really difficult, in a difficult spot. Yeah, and it makes, it makes your job, it's got to make your job harder yeah. and more well, heartrending, yeah. if you will. Because yeah. you're going to see, I'm sure you are seeing personal tragedy here as yeah. we read in the paper. Yeah, we are, we, we, we are seeing locally, we're seeing a lot of cases that had uh, where ICE Immigration and Customs Enforcement would, um, uh, you know, either extend or accept um, uh, arguments for why good people should be allowed to stay, even though there was no legal path for them. And although, you know, we've been pushing for many years to for uh, to create a legal path for good people who were here, who had children, who had spouses, um, and. Uh, again, locally, there was a, a degree of discretion as to whether those people could not fly under the radar because uh, immigration customs enforcement knew that they were in the United States, but they would they would let them uh, let them stay with their families. They'd have reporting requirements once a year or every six months check in. If people moved, they would need to um, inform the government of their address changes, those kind of things, um, and it was. We felt like we were buying time until there was a, a legal reform. path, until there was immigration reform, right? And so, well, may, you know, maybe next year, maybe, maybe in six months. Um, 
now we're seeing that there's no immigration reform, real solid immigration reform in sight that would benefit a lot of people, and that the discretion that ICE had been um, extending positively in many cases, they're not doing anymore. So we have, we've had some high profile cases just in our own state. Um, probably the most high profile case was um, Mr. Magana on the, the, ba the Big Island coffee farmer. That? Sure, I mean, there were, there, it, it, it was not my case. I'm Jim Stanton is his attorney, but from you know what I know about it, he was a very prominent uh, person in his community. He actually you know, did a lot as far as education about um, issues that coffee farms were having um, with, with pest control. He was a husband and a father um, to uh, U.S. He had U.S. citizen children and a U.S. citizen wife, and um, he basically had a, a final order of, of deportation. I believe they were trying to get the case reopened because there was a, uh, a visa petition that was filed or an immigrant relative petition filed by his wife, um, but it would have taken time to work through those things, those petitions, which before would take five to six months are now taking longer and longer they were trying to, we don't know exactly how long longer we? means we don't know exactly how long and I think Mr. Stanton was trying to keep him here um, so that that you know until that process could go through because once someone has to leave the United States it's it's years before they're able to right, come well, back in yeah they, they're on a line at the other end and they got to wait and nobody's in a hurry to help them these days it, it, it's a line the lines getting longer and it's a very expensive uh, and time-consuming process and in the meantime what benefit does it serve us as a society to have this man separated from his family from his farm from his community from I, I think there was, you know, the state had an interest in, in keeping him here because of his, his professional expertise. And, and um, as Senator Hirona and other people, uh, you know, got involved in his case as much as they could. But in the end, again, the kind of discretion that Homeland Security locally used to have, I think their hands are tied now. And I don't think the deci I mean, the, the decision on whether to grant a stay of deportation does not come from the local level. Mm. It comes from San Francisco. So locally, we fall under the San Francisco office, and the decisions are coming, are, are coming from there. So we actually have a lot of good, decent people who are working at Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And, uh, but I think what they want, if, if they would say, you know, want to allow Mr. Magana to stay, they can't. They can't. Yeah. Yeah, decisions are coming from it someplace else. It seems terribly unfair. I mean, now, if um, there was some early advice by the government to Mr. Magana saying, you, know, you can't stay here, we're not going to let you stay here, so don't have a family, don't start a farm, don't become an expert, don't make com community contributions, just go then, okay, so then he would leave. And, and you would sort of nip this problem vis-a-vis yeah. -vis his case in the bud. But he's been permitted to stay all these years. And he was brought as a kid. I mean, he was 15 when he, he was 15. 15. You know, what are you going to say to him at 15? He was 15, 15 when yeah. he came. Yeah. So, I mean, it's just terribly unfair that we, yeah. we come down like a sledgehammer right. in, in the life, you know, the life of this M Mr. Magana and others, many, many others. Right. Right. Um, and right. my recollection is the last time I knew that there had been 41,000 um, de detentions here in the United States. We do not see that as a headline. We do not see that for all the bombast in Washington. Right. Uh, right. We, it's, Congress is not talking about that, and Trump is not talking about that. Right. But, but the fact is he's busy, 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 busy all day. Right. creating these terribly unfair scenarios. And they're doing these these major sweeps, I mean, which are fine as far as picking up people who have dangerous criminal histories, but they're picking up all other kinds of people. Uh, making along no with, distinction. Uh, making no distinction. And then again, once people get in the deportation system, the discretion to take people out seems to have gone out the window with the Trump administration. So um, that's why you have, uh, and some cities are actively resisting uh, sanctuary this. cities, San but then the so-called sanctuaries. Well, then they get they get punished, and and they're challenging that they're challenging that in the courts. And it'll be very interesting to follow what's happening um, in Denver, in San Francisco, in San Antonio. 
Texas has, has um, also passed some really, really repressive anti-immigrant laws, but there's resistance from chiefs of police who say that, you know, these kind of laws that target people who are, you know, law-abiding, but for the immigration violation, which is a civil violation, it's not a criminal violation, um, people who are law-abiding, who are afraid to come out and, and report crimes, uh, because they're afraid of getting sure. turned over to ICE, that makes our communities, you know, less safe, and it impedes our ability to uh, to do our job and and build up trust with the community. So, yeah. there's a lot of there's a lot of resistance right now um, uh, nationally. Uh, there's a lot of resistance locally. I mean, we have a phenomenal attorney general who was out in 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 the forefront. Um, challenging about the ban, our, our state. Our, uh, sorry, sorry, yeah, I, uh, no, sorry, no, no, no. Doug, Doug Chin's mind popped, in, face popped into my mind, and not, not, <laughs> not Jeff Sessions. There could not be more, more polar opposite. Um, but um, Attorney General Chin is challenging these, um, at, at, you know, at every level on behalf of Hawaii, which I think um, really does our state really does our state proud. And I hope that I hope that people can see the value of. Uh, of, of what Hawaii has contributed yeah. um, to this. We have a great message, actually. We do. We, 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 have, we have something that is, these days, in short supply. That's true. We're going to take a break, actually, Claire. And when we come back, I'd like to tell you what worries me and see if it worries you also. All right. That's Claire Hannes. She's, she's an immigration attorney, and we love talking to her. Thanks, Jay. <laughs> This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. Living in this crazy world, so caught up in the confusion, nothing is making sense for me and you. Maybe we can find a way, there's got to be solution, how to make a problem. We're back. We're live with Claire Hannes. We're talking about the immigration changes in our country and how it affects the practice of immigration law, among other things. So how does it affect the practice? I would imagine that people walk into you now, people who you might have been able to help before, before mm -hmm. Trump, and you have to say to them, look, I'm, I'm really sorry, but this is all a very difficult situation, but I don't have the same legal tools available to me to help you. Yeah, so, well, you know, actually, I mean, the laws haven't changed yet because Trump, thankfully, can't change the laws. Congress makes and changes the laws. Oh, my God, and, somebody has to tell him that. Uh, well, I mean, it, I mean, it's, I mean so, the, the, so the reality is when people come to me, they think that, that Trump has a lot to do with their current situation. And, and the reality is that, that if they had options before, they generally still have options now. Um, I'm, I've always been very careful about screening cases to make sure that an application isn't submitted to the government that might have an issue that could put someone in a worse position than mm -hmm. they were before they submitted. Mm -hmm. I'm even more careful about that now because we've seen, especially at the local office, the level of fine-tooth scrutiny they're putting cases under is, is unbelievable. And I've seen locally uh, naturalizations denied um, for good people because of a silly little procedural defect that was done, that, w that was on the form 10 years ago, where an irrelevant form was missing. I mean, it was, it was the most ridiculous, but, but technically, technically the government w was right, and so that was it. So we just had to kind of throw our hands, but, but so that's what we're seeing locally as far as, as, far as changes Trump, go. He's telling his agency, they work for him, they're part of the you know, executive I, branch. I wish I was part of those discussions to know. I mean, we've had problems with the local office locally for a long time. 
uh, but it, it's, it, is, it is a new uh, cases that say a marriage-based green card case okay. that used to take pretty much 90 days start to finish for years. So I would just routinely say three months, right, start to, start to finish, unless there's a red flag, which I don't see. So uh, now it's taking uh, seven to nine months. And then what, what was a problem before, and it's even more of a problem now, is, is cases are going into these kind of black holes where you, you, know, you leave the interview, and they very rarely say, OK, everything looks great. We're going to grant this. They say, OK, thank you. We'll be in touch. And then people wait and wait and wait. And our abilities, even as attorneys, to get any kind of sense of how long it's going to take for this decision to, I mean, we, uh, we're stuck. And our clients get really frustrated with us. And I understand. They're thinking, well, we're paying for an attorney. We should. And I say, you know, our hands are tied, too. I mean, we've, I've kind of half joked about a hunger strike in front of the USCIS <laughs> office local. Like, I mean, just to, just to shame and put some attention on it. Um, I joke about hunger strike. But like, what, I mean, what can be done? It's, it's, it's ridiculous. We have our congressional liaisons involved. Um, their hands are often tied. Um, you know, we kick and scream, we file complaints and, and requests, and, uh, and we get this, oh, we're, you know, we're sorry for the delay, the case is under, you know, either some kind of administrative processing. And we're seeing those delays longer and longer. So that's what's stressing people out and, and stressing us as, sure. as advocates out it, my as sense well. from what you say is that it's getting worse, is it? It is getting worse. It is getting worse. And I think, you know, Trump, when he talked about this initial Muslim ban, it was, remember, it was a, a kind of a pause on immigration from certain yeah. countries yeah. for them to review the vetting procedures, which were arguably fine before, kind of under the guise of a Muslim. Well, this kind of extreme vetting is, um, I think, going on at, at all levels right now. And again, we, you know, we have no problem with background checks, of course, and with um, with the sure. United States fair doing what, of course, what it what it can to um, to kind of you know weed people out or you know make sure that the people who are staying have this goes I have, followed, that. have followed the this goes this is going way 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 mm -hmm. beyond mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. and it's it's causing a lot of undue uh, stress on people mm -hmm. locally, but generally people have the same options. But what might change is is so there was this Raise Act that was proposed. Um, on October 2nd by two uh, Republican senators from the south of the U U.S. with Trump's blessing. And that would, that would have major, if something like that passed, it would have major. Well, so it, it does a couple of things. First of all, it, it, it creates this um, kind of preference category for immigrants who ha have, um, speak English, are well-educated, can show financial means, and have a good chance, so it says, of, of employment. So it's, a, it's kind of a merit-based system, where our system before had been primarily um, of the maybe 1.2 million immigrants that came in um, last year. Most of them were family-based, meaning that I became a US citizen. I filed a, an immigrant petition for my mom mm -hmm. so that my mom could come here, mm -hmm. or my brother or sister. And if you're from the Philippines, it can take 25 years. But eventually, if they live that long, they're able to come. The families, you know, about oh. family, family unity, family reunification. There's a lot to say for that. That is a lot to say for that, and that's a lot, a lot to say for our local communities, right? Um, sure. uh, our local, which we have a, a, a high, a, kind of a high immigrant. Yeah. Absolutely, we have a high immigrant population. Um, but what this Raise Act would do is it would actually Cut eliminate, yeah. eliminate by up to half of the family-based immigration. It wouldn't eliminate all family-based immigration, but some categories it would wipe out completely. For example, if I was a US citizen, I wouldn't be able to get a green card for my mom. That's huge. That's terrible. I wouldn't be able to apply for a green card for my brother so or sister. family remains separate. Yep. That's what happens. Yep. I mean, they could come in and, and try to get visitors' visa and, and to visit. But we can, and look at, I mean, and Hawaii is an island. It's not as though we're in California and a lot of our relatives are in Mexico, right? And you can, I mean, when you're in Hawaii, you're isolated. You're, isolated. you're yeah. really far away. And you want your family, you want your family close to you. And this would cut that out. So, Claire, you know, you, you didn't go into immigration law to make uku bucks. Nope. You went to help people. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, you, and you persist in that, in that desire, I'm sure. Um, but now you can't help them in the same way, perhaps, that you could before. Mm -hmm. And I guess the question is, um, 
you know, not only you, but the bar, the immigration mm -hmm. bar must be affected by these, call them policy changes or, you know, de facto policy changes is right. what we have. Right, right. So, A, can you make a living doing this? Or do you have to put in pro bono time in order to, you know, meet the demand walking in the door? And, and B, you know, should I go into immigration law now? Is it the right time? Yeah. Should I go to law school and study for three years and then go into immigration law? Yeah. I mean, the, the, the problem with immigration law is that there are many more people who need services than there are people who can pay for services, yeah. right? And we have, um, we have a huge problem in Hawaii where we don't have a general immigration legal service provider um, uh, such as a legal aid. Like legal aid, because their, their funding is federal, they're limited as to the scope of services that they can provide. So through the Hawaii Immigrant Justice Center, they can provide services to a very limited number of immigrants with immigrated immigrant related and limited needs. services at that super limited services right yeah. so so for say crime victims victims of domestic violence which are crime victims tra human trafficking victims they have a place to go everyone else you're pretty much on your own and immigration law is very very confusing so it's really hard for people to figure out and on you their make own. a silly technical mistake and you're dead meat yeah, it's it, there's a lot there's a lot at stake. You have to be very very careful. So it's not something that you can it's not something that you can dabble in. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think I mean if you're if you're doing good work, you can definitely make a living at it. It's it's not one of the most lucrative uh, uh, areas, mm -hmm. um, and I think most of us who do immigration law do a fair amount of pro bono work, mm -hmm. and because we. We, we recognize the importance, the, the really life-changing importance of what we do, and, um, but, but we have to limit the amount of pro bono work we do because... What concerns me is that coming out of law school, not just me, but people and lawyers in general who might otherwise devote their time and skill and you know, their, their practice to immigration law, might be discouraged from doing it. And if that happens, we have fewer immigration lawyers still right. yet. Right. And the result is there'd be fewer resources available to people right. who need resources, nor now than before. Right. And so they'll, these, these poor people will be even more the victim going forward. And, the, and this new change in policy will have the desired effect of, of barring them and more. Because One thing we've seen is that there's, there's so much outrage over the Trump administration policies towards immigrant and refugees that I think there's been a resurgence of people who are interested in pursuing immigration law. Mm, and good. I'm working with some fabulous Great. law students um, who are um, volunteering to help me uh, on some of my pro bono cases, which is, which is great. Um, as far as whether there's a place for them in the market, again, that's, that's tough because there's lots of need, but there's not a lot of people who can afford the services, uh, especially yeah. in deportation proceedings. Yeah. Deportation proceedings, it's like, it's, it's like criminal defense. Um, it's, it's super, super time consuming. It's super detailed. And um, it, it's, uh, it's expensive. It, it, it's a lot of attorney time and attorney time costs. So this is really a bad situation. It's, it's, it's bad for the country and, and the structure of the family and the community and the society. Yeah. Morally, it's bad for us. It's, it's, it's bad, tragically bad for all these people. Um, it's bad for our image around the world. Right. We're no longer the, you know, the Statue of Liberty with open arms. Uh, other countries do way, way better. I mean, in Canada, for example, right. much more well, open. We have, we have refugees who are fleeing from the United States into Canada yeah. uh, right now. And, and Canada is treating them way better in lots of ways um, yeah. than the United States yeah. ever did. Um, but again, you know, locally, uh, as far as resistance efforts, you know, again, law students stepping forward. We have attorneys stepping forward, and so. Are we a sanctuary city? We are. Well, no, we are not. I mean, there's, a sanctuary city is, city is kind of a squishy term. Um, I, I, we do not have uh, our leaders have not very proactively come out and said that they were not going to, or that they were going to absolutely refuse to. Uh, do the work of the federal government, um, which is what which is what the sanctuary cities are saying that yeah. that they're not going to uh, turn into immigration enforcement yeah. agents. Um, I, I wonder how immigration enforcement. You you, you said that the, the immigration service has as always has 
has certain obligations. It must, you know, uh, enforce the law. But at the same time, they're, they're human beings, hopefully. Right. Right. And uh, they may be told, uh, they may be told to do policy things that they don't really agree with, especially right. if they've been in immigration for a long time and they've seen all these people come and go and the reasons for their comings and goings. Right. Right. And so I really wonder whether there's resistance. Maybe, you know, it's nothing that we can know, but I wonder if there's resistance within the immigration service itself to this policy where they, you know, they really hate doing what they're being asked to do. I think a lot of them do, although as far as resistance, I think they're still pretty much doing their jobs. Enforcement. Uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 I've I, and people uh, who work at ICE have said, you know, don't blame us, blame the laws. And 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 you it's know easy, that's it's easy to say that. But. Yeah. Um, you know, but I, I, I understand. You know, I, I understand where they're where they're coming from too. And while I couldn't do their job personally. Um, again, a lot of them are, are really decent human beings, and I've seen I've seen my clients more often than not actually treated with with uh, a great degree of compassion, mm -hmm. and you can tell that the officers don't enjoy uh, the answers that they have to give uh, a mm -hmm. lot of these people as far as what their options are, mm -hmm. uh, or when a stay is denied, they don't uh, you know do little happy dances and said okay we're getting rid of another one. I mean they. Mm -hmm. I think they. I think they feel it. Um, they feel it too. Uh, Here's what I worry about more than anything else, Claire. You know, it, we've come a long way down, in my opinion, uh, since January 20th. In many ways, not just immigration, but right. certainly that is a, a centerpiece of how we've come down. And day by day, it's happening. We may not see it in the headlines, but it's happening. There are detentions, and there is there are these regrettable outcomes and in the immigration process and um, people are being hurt, their lives are being damaged. And so what I worry about is, is that we become complacent about this. You can't protest these things every day. Right. The community can't write a letter every day as long as it continues, even though it should. Um, and we may become complacent and treat it, if you will, this is a term that seems to be appropriate, as the new normal. The new normal is, is devolving into another dark place. And I worry that, that that will continue in this administration. And we've only seen the beginning of it. It's going to get worse because nobody, no large group, no political force can stop it. So therefore, it takes heart in that, and it continues and gets more bold all the right, time. Right. What do we do, Claire? You know, I, I think locally, Locally, the resistance makes me a little bit more optimistic, maybe, than you are, as far as this being accepted as the, as, as the new normal and we can't do anything. I mean, there, there are cases where we're definitely very limited about uh, what we can do, but that has not stopped the community from showing up, from showing up, from talking about what we can do, from supporting each other, from... I mean, the um, just um, Sunday night, right after after you know, so Charlottesville was Saturday. Sunday night, there were hundreds of people who came out to Magic Island for uh, a candlelight vigil in solidarity uh, with the people of Charlottesville. And we um, uh, there were sheets on the ground where we could write messages to um, Heather Heyer's family, right, the the 32 year old who was. Uh, and that was really, um, I think it's really important for us as a as a community. And there were, you know, there were a lot of the old timers who you kind of expect to be there, but a lot of new faces. So I think that this that like, the worst in this country is also bringing out some of the best. And I'm, you know, I'm not worried about if I have, yeah, you know, I've had have two moms who had to report for removal, and there were huge within a short period of time, huge groups of people who showed up to support them. I think those people, because many of them are, they're, they're people of faith, they're people who are, have been in civil rights struggles for the long haul, they will keep coming out time after time after time. And new people will come along too. And I mean, the, the thing, we do have to pace ourselves in a way because four years is a long time and we're, we're only a, a bit into it. And um, and even if even if Trump leaves office, part of me it thinks that it, this isn't so much 
Trump as as the the people the people behind him. Jeff Sessions, base, right? Yeah. Jeff Sessions is. I mean, he's he's the architect mm -hmm. of many of these immigration policies, and he has a he has a lot of support. So we have to be. Even if Trump falls, that doesn't mean that things are going to uh, another no, Republican is no, going no, to get no. in, and things are going to get better. Yeah. So we have to. But I, I'm I actually think we will be able to. We see a light at the end of the tunnel, and we're going to keep. Um, fighting and challenging until we get to that light. And then hopefully, I don't know what kind of state the country will be in in three and a half years. Well, it'll be different. And the question really is when, when this administration's done, I think I know the answer already, when this administration's done, will we just zing back to the way it was before um, with more caring and heart and um, you know, humanity, concern for humanity? Or, or will we be in a different place, uh, looking for a different direction, that may not be what we what we really want? Uh, a different direction that doesn't zing back to the way it was before. And I think the answer is all of this is on the record, all of this is historic, yeah. all of this goes forward, um, and you can never go home again. Yeah. Uh, it will all feed into the ultimate outcome. But even as far as immigration policy, again, we, I just have to keep remembering, it wasn't so great under the Obama administration either. The Democrats, um, President Clinton signed um, some very repressive immigration laws during his time. So, um, yeah, it wasn't as bad as it, as it is now, and I don't know how much worse it's going to get. But I don't want to also kind of paint over with a, a rosy picture what, what happened, you know, prior sure. to Trump because it was it was pretty rough on immigrants sure. before. We have to take it all in context. We have to take it all on a historic continuum. Mm -hmm. We have to remember where we've been if we want to find out where, you, where we're going right. or should go. And one thing, Claire, is so clear to me after this discussion is that it's not over. We can't be complacent. No. We can't treat it as the new normal. And we have to see you again here to keep current. I'll be here. Thank you, Claire. Thank you, Jay.